So we probably have some bad news. Um, Evan didn't control, uh, destroy export controls uh, back in the 90s. So he did win, win the crypto wars, but there are still export regulations around this. Um, and I, this is a Debian laptop, but I'm not giving it away. I'm going to keep it. Uh, <laughs> In part because while I don't exactly remember installing the first releases of Debian, I definitely have a distinct memory of installing Debian 3.0. So I'm going to go ahead and claim that I've been using Linux before Debian existed because I was there when they, they were trying to solve the problem of Slackware, which kind of worked as I remember it, but I was only 13 or 14 at the time. So maybe I just didn't know what I was doing. Uh, I got some eyebrows raised there, so maybe I said the wrong thing. Um, <laughs> my day job is a little bit different now. Um, going, not working full time doing that anymore, and I'm a systems architect at the university now. They didn't like some of my security recommendations when I was there enough to keep me on that job, or maybe they liked my infrastructure recommendations more, so they moved in for that, however they wanted to do it. Um, so, but what I'm here to talk to you about is FOSS and export regulations. So I already told you the bad news, they still exist. Um, maybe a little bit more bad news is anytime you post software on the internet, you've just exported something or you've been deemed to have exported something. Um, the primary reason is the US government still wants to look at encryption software. Um, we can probably see why they want to look at encryption source software. I don't think I need to read anyone a newspaper from the last couple of months. So what FOSS, FOSS software is still controlled by export controls? Well, in a broader sense, Everything that ships outside the United States is controlled by export controls. There are lots of export control regimes out there. You can't ship anything to Iran without talking to the U.S. government. That's not what I'm going to talk about there. There are those comprehensive regimes. I'm going to talk about the EAR, which is the primary regime that you were talking about when we're exporting FOSS software. The EAR is covering dual-use goods. So this is what we successfully managed to do in the 90s. The military thought that export encryption was only for the military. We clarified that for him, like, no, individuals and corporations have legitimate use for privacy as well. It's not just something for the military. In the EAR, they've got this big gaping hole that seems like it's perfectly made for FOSS. It's actually a little bit bigger than FOSS. It's publicly available software. What's publicly available software? Well, publicly available software is software that's publicly available. It's software that's generally accessible to the interested public and available for distribution at, for, a, for free or at a price that doesn't exceed the cost of distribution. That actually includes things that are not just FOSS software. You can be shipping object code and not revealing your source code and still meet that definition. But this dovetails perfectly with the common FOSS development model. FOSS software is distributed for free. It's distributed at, with no licensing costs and it's published on the internet. This is how we do business every single day. No one has to think about it. Most FOSS software is just going to qualify as publicly available software. You might be asking now, of course, well, what doesn't qualify as publicly available software? Well, as with ex the export controls, there are exceptions. So what's the exception? 5D002. What's 5D002? That's the software that's described by 5A002. <laughs> <clears throat> I'm not going to go into the nitty gritties of export control regulations. If anyone really wants to talk about the Code of Federal Regulations with me, I actually kind of like it now. It's an interesting little puzzle. Um, but I don't think most people are going to agree with it. It took a little while to wrap my head around it. And of course, in 5A002, there are exceptions. And there are exceptions to those exceptions. So what you need to know with, with FOSS when it comes to this, though, is basically any modern cryptographic software, anything worth using, Anything that's been worth using since the mid-90s, so maybe some stuff that's not even worth using anymore, it's described by 5A002, which is 5D002. There are some major exceptions to that. I won't go through all of them, but it's not everything out there. If you're just using cryptography for like password authentication and that's the only reason you're using it, you probably qualify for an exception. There are some other ones, too, that get a little bit more complicated. At the end of the day, what the government's going to be looking for is your software use or contain encryption technology. It's not what the regulations say. The regulations are a very, very long sentence, but it's use or contained encryption technology. That's kind of hard, though. Right? FOSS projects, software in general, well, like, it includes lots of libraries. Libraries that the developer of that application probably didn't write. He probably borrowed from someone else. This is the development model that we have. These products can be hundreds of thousands of lines, millions of lines of code in a single product. Sometimes it's only hundreds of lines of code. Someone remembers how that software actually worked. But when you start talking about 10,000, 100,000 lines of code, you don't understand how your code worked anymore. You probably remember if you're using encryption, but you probably don't know if all the libraries that you're using in your product and shipping with your product contain encryption. 
one particular product they reviewed for a client recently, they were using it as a data, database abstraction library. They didn't use the encryption layer in it, but it was built into the library. They were shipping that library with their product. They've got encryption in their product. It contained the encryption. So how do we solve this problem? Well, you hire an attorney who has an experience in IT. <coughs> <laughs> um, unfortunately for Evan, he didn't hire a software programmer. He hired somebody who just made software programmers lives hell because I like to think I know how to program, but let's face it, I was a sysadmin. Yeah, not really. Um, so what did I do? I wrote a tool that's going through and looking through all these 100,000 lines of code to find the interesting points. So this is just pinpointing the locations in software where we need to go and look and see, is this actually encryption software or encryption technology? Is it being used in the product? How is it being used in the product? And is there any way that it can get this out of the exception? Because if it's not only 5D002, it's not controlled by export controls, except for those few exceptions. You can't ship it to Iran and a few other places. You don't need to do anything. The problem with this, like I said, is you need an attorney who understands both these export control regulations with all of the exceptions, and there are a lot of them, and understands programming. I don't understand all the programming languages, but I like to think that I can read most of them, and documentation helps. So for all the coders out there, you know, put those, co put those comments in the code. Somebody does actually look at them eventually. So there are three ways to export once you've found out that you're stuck inside of this regime. You could actually get a license. You could not get a license, the no license required exception, which weirdly enough requires registration. I don't know about that one. Or you can get a license exception, which doesn't require any license, it just requires a little bit of notification. The license exceptions for publicly available encryption source code. Notice this is a little bit different than publicly available software because we're actually talking about source code at this point because the government wants to see the software. So the publicly available encryption source code, it can be exported without a license. What's publicly available encryption source code? I'm a lawyer, so I figured out you look up the definition for everything. Fortunately, publicly available actually means publicly available. <laughs> it's got to be on a public location on the internet. There are other ways of doing it too. You could, every time you make a change to your source code, you could send a copy of your source code to the government, but I don't know why anyone in the FOSS community would be doing that. Just put it up on GitHub or your own local Git repository. Then you've got to tell the government where it's going to go. Now, they don't say this in the regulations. You are notifying BIS. BIS admits to it. Com the Commerce Department, Bureau of Industry and Security admits that you're sending them. The NSA also has to be notified too. Now, I don't know why. I don't know what they're going to be doing with it. Maybe they actually look at it. Maybe they don't. Um, the regulations, interestingly enough, just tell you that's the encryption coordinator, and then they give you the email address at the NSA. So maybe I'm letting the cat out of the bag here, but I think we know it's the NSA. Now, <clears throat> the nice thing about this is you only need to notify them once. Um, some of our clients that we've looked at, they change the location of where they're publishing their source code, and if you do that, you're going to have to notify them every single time, which, you know, emails, that's so much work. You don't need to do that. Just keep posting it to that GitHub location. Stop changing your version control repositories. Um, and then you're going to have to maintain records. Now, for most FOSS individuals, what records do we have? Well, we've got our source code. Well, you already told them about the location of that. You don't actually talk to the people downloading your source code, right? You give it away to anyone who wants it. Um, and I know no one looks at logs because, well, I've run web servers, and yeah, sometimes I looked at the logs. Um, but you're going to have to maintain the records. And the one record you're, at the minimum you're going to have is that email. You're going to have to maintain that email. If you ever have some kind of agreement with someone to ship software somewhere on a thumb drive because for some reason the internet doesn't work, uh, <laughs> you should keep track of those too. But um, for the most part, just keep track of that email for a while. So what does compliance look like? It looks like an email. Um, here we go. We've got the two email addresses at the top, one to the BIS, one to the encryption uh, coordinator, who may or may not work at the NSA. It depends on what you're reading to email addresses. You should CC the guy in your project who's actually going to keep, uh, keep uh, a copy of these records because he's got to hold on to them for a couple of years. That's probably you. Um, I don't like keeping things in my sent folder. Um, and then you just have to tell them what you're doing. If you're using the TSU exception, some contact information because they'd probably be mad if you didn't give it to them and the internet location on the bottom along with the name of the product so that they can actually recognize what the product they're talking about there. So the advantage of the TSU, uh, like I said before, there's no registration required for this process. There's just a notification, that's a simple email. There are no fees. Both the no license required uh, authorization and the encryption 
authorization require a fairly hefty fee, which most FOSS projects aren't going to want to fumble around for a few thousand dollars. There's no approval required. The encryption license actually requires approval from the government to export. Uh, the no license required authorization doesn't require approval, but you've got to wait 30 days because they might want to hold that up. Which comes to the TSC was also no delay in exporting. As I told you before, publishing software on the internet is actually exporting. So, and you've got to tell them the location of it. So you kind of have a little bit of a race there if you want to follow this regulation. You shouldn't post that software until you've notified them about it, however you want to do that. Uh, and it only needs to be done once if you do it properly. So let's maintain our source code in a managed way. We've got a couple white papers on how our recommendations for managing source code. Um, the big thing about this, though, um, especially for companies, is minimizing red flag and know your customer requirements, which anyone who's done any kind of banking or anything to do with export controls in general, red flag and know your customer requirements are you need to know who you're doing business with. Posting soft source code on the Internet doesn't imply that you know who's downloading it according to the government, which is great because we don't actually know who's downloading it. Everyone's downloading, whoever wants is downloading it, but they actually do enforce this rule. For those of you who troll the export control blogs, um, which I'm sure there's many people out there, um, there was actually a recent enforcement action by the BIS for a self-reporting, which is kind of uncommon. Traditionally, when you screwed up these regulations, you would just tell the government, mea copa, they say, oh, that's fine, comply with the regulations now. But a couple of months ago, and a subsidiary of Intel got fined three quarters of a million dollars for exporting operating systems. Now, I don't know what operating systems they were exporting. The company in, in question has two. They've got a real-time operating system and a Linux distribution. Um, but for five years, they weren't telling anyone about it. And unfortunately, they were shipping these products to foreign governments, which may or may not have been on the no-no list, but it can get expensive if you don't need, if you don't, uh, you're not knowing what you're doing there. The TSU doesn't require you to follow through on that. So for free software projects, this seems pretty simple. Um, it's, you know, you have to follow the rules, which I know hackers don't always like following the rules, but this is a relatively simple one, and the procedures actually kind of dovetail nicely with the FOSS development model. So are there any questions? You said you define all the terms. Um, one of the terms that I think was not defined was encryption. So uh, I'm just curious whether that means, like, is the hashing algorithm encryption? Is HMAC encryption? Is uh, our symmetric, like, asymmetric algorithm encryption? Like, at what, at what point do we say, well, Git uses, forget about HTTPS transport, but Git uses uh, hashing algorithms for the revision Right. So uh, the 5A002 has a fairly extensive list of technologies that they're interested in. So asymmetric and symmetric uh, encryption over a certain bit, uh, bit amount are included in that and things like that. Um, I have seen some uh, technologies who've published online saying like, oh, this isn't encryption because I'm doing something different. It just does exactly the same thing. Yeah, they have things like that too. So they're trying to sweep in a lot of things there. But the regulations do actually clarify that using um, digest hashes don't qualify as encryption. So if you're just trying to get that SH1 or SH256 hash on that file to verify file integrity, that's not actually encryption. Um, but that's where you get into the weeds of what qualifies, what doesn't qualify. It qualifies unless you're doing it this way. Um, you're using it for this purpose, then it gets kicked out. Uh, the information I presented here is from the regulations, so you're welcome to read that. Um, we, do have, <laughs> we do have a publication, uh, and some of those materials are included in the CLE material. I tried to excerpt the relevant portions, so the particular text of the TSU exception, which is actually not that hard to read. It's less than one page and is written in normal English, not lawyer English. Um, I've also included the, ex the definition of 5A002, which for certain individuals you could probably look at that list a little bit easier than I could and go like, ah, yes. I studied that in graduate school, or that's what I play with every day. Um, but we're also working on a, uh, an FAQ related to, I'm not sure when that's going to get published. But it will get published. That is to say, we are publishing additional advice on the subject for self-application. The tool that Mark spoke about in the talk is still, in our view, under development on RIPE, but will shortly be published uh, as free software. 
Uh, automated scanning in this area, for the reasons that Mark has laid out, is not a sufficient basis upon which to make conclusions. This is a tool designed to be used by skilled hands uh, in order to winnow code bases quickly to what matters. Uh, for that purpose, uh, we think it's going to turn out to be extremely helpful. Uh, we're very grateful to the Linux Foundation for affording us a lot of material on which to work. Uh, our first efforts in this direction uh, were uh, directed in a project to help Linux Foundation assess its own export control uh, compliance with respect to all software directly made available to the public by LF. Uh, and we have moved on with LF's encouragement and the encouragement of its member companies to some other uh, large and important code bases which we will be reporting on or have reported on uh, to LF and which will ultimately become public in the industry. Uh, one important wrinkle to mention about this is that uh, people take uh, FOSS projects which may contain encryption and be subject to TSU exceptions uh, and they build them into other products and ship those products at which point they are no longer in the simple TSU exception realm. And so what we are hoping is that by publishing information, tooling, presenting through LF and other umbrella organizations uh, ways of performing skilled evaluation of the free software and the TSU exception uh, 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 susceptibility or qualification of software, we can also simplify the tasks of those people downstream in industry productizing. Uh, I'm pre-announcing only in that narrow sense. We will finish our review of Open Daylight shortly. Uh, that will certainly be helpful because there is an awful lot of SDN going on in the world and it will, some of it, be done using pure open daylight and it would be awfully good to know that that stuff can move around the world. But it is also true, of course, that that will be productized in many different ways and put into hardware and software systems of many different kinds, all of which will then also have to meet uh, encryption export control. Uh, licensing requirements and our hope is that the work on the free software infrastructure will massively reduce costs and friction uh, for downstream industrial partners even if they are not shipping purely publicly available software in our sense.